very good morning to one and all of you. First and foremost, uh, I would want to uh, specially invite all the expert panel who are here, who have specially come here, and the experts of experts. And we have Dr. Surinder Singh Pandav, who is going to be joining us soon, who is <coughs> the <coughs> president of GSI. We have Dr. Satin Parthasadi to be joining us very soon, director of so come and sit in front. <coughs> come and sit in front. Satyan, who's the director of Satyan Eye Care Hospital and an amazing surgeon and a very reputed surgeon from south of India. We have truly delighted to have Dr. <coughs> Lingam Vijaya with us, who's not just a senior consultant of Medical Research Foundation. Probably she's also a past president, not probably, she's a past president of GSI and some are really, truly happy to have her uh, in this uh, uh, ARC session of ours. Truly indebted to have Dr. Vinay Nangya, who's the chairman of the Suraj Eye Institute, Nagpur, who should be joining us soon with us. And thanks a lot, Dr. Mayuri Kamar, for being with us. Uh, and again, another amazing surgeon with years of experience. Without delay, uh, there is going to be a very minor change in the schedule, Dr. Ch Chandrima Paul wants to be the first speaker as she has some commitment elsewhere. And she's the director and consultant of the Glockma Services at BBI Foundation and also the proud pride of GSI, the Honorary General Secretary. And we look forward to hearing from her on optic disc evaluation, preferred practice guidelines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chitra, for this invite. It is indeed a pleasure to be here this morning. And uh, I'm sorry to disrupt the flow, but I have an instruction course which I have to rush to. So I take you through optic disc evaluation, which I feel is the cornerstone of glaucoma diagnosis. I'll keep it short and sweet so that, uh, you know, uh, in the interest of time. Otherwise, you could actually talk on the optic disc for the whole day. Anyway, high intraocular pressure is not primary open Good. angle glaucoma. Mm. And we've seen that many a time a, a patient might come to you with high intraocular pressure but does not have any other uh, glaucomatous features. So these changes precede visual field loss in most cases. So that's the uh, normal disc that you see, the neuroretinal rim which generally is pink and carries actions of the retinal ganglion cells, the central cup, the white depression, uh, the horizontal diameter less than the um, uh, vertical diameter, and usually the horizontally oval is the normal cup. And that's when uh, we have a disc which is suspicious or has some pathognomonic changes. And finally, we have the advanced uh, discs that you see out there. These are just schematic diagrams. So I would always say to keep a drawing of the disc as you see it, because there's inter uh, observer variation, and someone else might Dr. see the disc. First row. But seeing Dr. your Pan uh, so in the first diagram row. would know what's happening. And that's uh, just to uh, go through the alpha and beta zones. What we are interested in is the beta zone Dr. So and the, the scleral First lip, show. the scleral tunnel rim is actually what we see as the uh, a cup. And uh, next we move on to the five R's, which you all are very familiar with, the scleral ring to identify the limits of the optic disc and identify the size of the rim. Next is the retinal nerve fiber layers, which you need to see very carefully. Examine the region of parapapillary atrophy and look for retinal or optic disc hemorrhages. So the optic disc as we see it here, that's the scleral ring and the vertical disc diameter and horizontal disc diameters, which I just told you about. And the measurements according to the lens that you're using at the slit lamp, the high plus lenses and the manufacturer's constant for those lenses. And that's the average vertical and horizontal diameters. So the size of the cup varies with the size of the disc. Large discs would have large cups where you would diagnose glaucoma more often than you would do in small discs with small cups where you actually might miss the diagnosis because of the small size of the disc. And uh, next is the neuroretinal rim and that is what we are actually interested in. So it's like a donut where we're interested in the chocolate and not really the hole in the center. And uh, sorry. The area, the configuration, and the pallor that you see in the neuroretinal rim, and that is the loss of rim tissue, which goes on in glaucoma. There isn't rule, which you all know, the inferior border followed by the superior nasal, and finally the temporal. That's the order in which it should go. Any deviation from that yeah. needs follow-up. That's the neuroretinal rim and the isn't rule, the parapapillary atrophy. As I told you, we're interested in the beta zone, the zone right next to the disc, uh, which shows up and uh, not the alpha zone. So the optic disc hemorrhages, 
that's uh, the most pathognomonic area, of course, is the inferior uh, part of the disc, and that would uh, generally disappear in two to six weeks and get converted to a notch. And uh, that's the notch that you see out there. And then we come to the RNFL. A lot of talk about RNFL in OCTs and everywhere else. But as you uh, actually evaluate the disc, it is probably one of the surest ways that you can see. If you see it in red light, you'd see those bright silver striations that you see out there. And uh, then you can grade it moderate, mild, moderate, and severe. And uh, there's diffuse and uh, localized RNFL thinning as well. The cup to disc ratio, we generally uh, assign a one to the entire disc, and then you calculate it according to the neuroretinal rim that you see out there. So if you consider this, then say it's 0 0.10, and that's 0 0.10. So this would be, say, a 0 0.80 cup. And similarly goes on uh, for the others as well. And uh, asymmetry of cup size is actually one of the pathognomonic signs. More than a cutoff of more than uh, 0.2 would definitely uh, require your attention. But you can also get them in other congenital anomalies, which you have to be uh, uh, aware about. And these are features which you see, like not, uh, notching and focal loss. Then you have the acquired pit of the thing, which you have to be careful, or the diffuse rim loss, nasalization of the vessels. I'll just run through these, because in the uh, interest of time, Bayonetting vessels, these are very pathognomonic sign. The bending of the vessel that you see as it lifts the disc margin, that's very important that is there. And uh, the hallmarks of correct evaluation of the optic nerve head in suspected glaucoma, measurement of the vertical ONH size at the slit lamp with dilated pupils, detection of the vertical and horizontal CDR, and careful consideration of the association between optic disc size and optic uh, cup size, assessment of the integrity of the neuroretinal rim, and the review of the characteristics of the isn't rule, exploration of the presence of beta zone, assessment of the optic nerve head for the presence of vascular changes, like barring or, uh, of, the, uh, or of the vessels or nasalization of the vessels or arteriolar thinning, and assessment of the peripapillary and retinal nerve fiber layer integrity, and exploration of focal or diffuse retinal nerve fiber layer defects with a red-free filter. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Chandrima. That was a uh, very good talk of yours, which covered everything. I want one question from uh, question to Dr. Vijaya. Now, you have a patient with a splinter hemorrhage when you see the disc. And uh, if the IOP looks quite decent and low target, uh, otherwise for the disc uh, size, would you go after that splinter hemorrhage and further lowering or would you evaluate more? What would you do? I want mics for what has happened. Where is audio visual? So sorry. I keep one more mic, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chitra. Uh, splinter hemorrhage does make mean that uh, there is the, the disease is likely to progress. Yes. So there is a need to uh, relook at all the parameters. Possibly you have to look at beyond IOP also if yes. needed. Yes. Because uh, at least in our uh, scenario, we don't see splinter hemorrhages in all POAGs, mm. but we do often see them in the NTG. NTG. So if you see a splinter hemorrhage, there is a need to relook at your uh, target pressure, whether the patient is taking the medication. Is there any concurrent use of the steroid that would have caused the rise in pressure? So there is a need to address a lot of things. You may not see any progression at that stage, either with your OCT or with the HVF. If we wait a couple of months when the okay. hemorrhage disappears, you do see definitely a progression in the visual field and the OCT. Yes, thank so you. you have to relook at it. Thank you very much. I have one question to Dr. Satyan. What would you say is the relevance of a disc damage likelihood scale for resident training? How would it differentiate them? It's a difficult question for me to answer that because uh, I'm not sure how many of us really follow the DDLS uh, scoring system, but uh, with the advent of other methods like uh, OCT with uh, uh, like BMO, I think we will be going to the next level rather than just looking only at that. But the importance is small disc with the small cup is important, large disc with the large cup may not be having a glaucoma, so that is one thing which we can really look at. I also wondered, each time that sometimes a patient is seen by different consultants, if we make it a habit 
I'm sure you are an expert, but uh, if we make it a system that all the pe all the consultants write down the disc damage like include staging, when they see the disc, the next time you see the right from the beginning itself, you know there is some change which is happening, no? I, th I think more than that, I would suggest it's so easy to capture a picture. Actually, yeah. I was about to say that. In the yes. standard magnification, yeah. if you have in your EMR as a part of it, Absolutely. it's always, because again, your assessment of the disc can vary. Yeah. yeah. That is exactly, I was yeah. trying So to how say. often should the fundus fo disc photographs be taken? And there is, is there no any often, it is a must, that's it. For every visit. We not do not it every visit. visit. That's not what I'm. Uh, no, not, uh, not every visit. That's no, what. That's how what. often means every six months or one year. No, 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 no. If you see minimum is if yearly once. If there is once. a change, if you suspect yeah. a change, take, the, take it again. Yeah. 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 Minimum, I feel, is yearly once is. Uh, I would yes. uh, want uh, thanks, Dr. Chandra. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would want Dr. Subhashini. I actually would request the next speakers to be ready with their presentation and. Just a minute before, uh, you are the f first speaker, no? So you would do it. So that we do not delay at all. I want maximum discussion for our younger audience there. Uh, Dr. Subhasini Kaliya Permal again needs no introduction. She is the head professor of uh, ophthalmology at uh, uh, Puducherry Jipma. Glaucoma, cataract, and refractive surgery is her specialties. And she is going to talk on something so quintessential to glaucoma, a comprehensive guide to workup, investigation, and follow-up. I don't know how she's going to do the magic in six minutes. We look forward to it. Yes, I, I to, uh, don't understand. <laughs> Let me try as much as possible. So, yes, thank you, ma'am. Uh, as madam said, the topic is a comprehensive guide to workup, investigations, and follow-up in glaucoma. Not moving. Ah. The aims of initial assessment, that's the workup, is to determine whether or not glaucoma is present and uh, the type of glaucoma, whether it's primary or secondary, open angle or angle closure, and the severity of the glaucoma. And then we also need to assess the risk profile of the patient and to exclude or confirm alternative diagnosis and to identify the underlying mechanism of uh, damage because this is what guides the appropriate management and finally to plan a management strategy. So the initial assessment can be divided into three phases, history, examination, and investigations. And in the history, so as you all know, most glaucomas are asymptomatic. So we can focus on the risk factors for glaucoma like family history and uh, history of, uh, I mean, if refractive errors are there, and to assess the medical and social factors that will affect treatment decisions. In past medical history, we need to consider what are the factors that will affect the life expectancy and adherence with treatment. We also need to exclude a past history of systemic conditions uh, like hemodynamic crisis uh, or acute blood loss. We need to ask for that specific history, uh, like in case of postpartum hemorrhage or severe trauma. And also in anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, there's disc pallor and cupping, or even in intracranial pathology. So these are conditions which will mimic glaucoma, but they're not progressive. An important history is this medication history in glaucoma. Steroids uh, by any route uh, is important. And uh, if already the patient is on glaucoma eye drops, you need to know those details. Systemic medications like anticholinergic and tricyclic uh, antidepressants can cause angle closure. And we all know topiramate uh, causes bilateral acute angle closure. Systemic uh, beta blockers if the patient is taking for hypertension. So that can interact with the topical beta blockers and the beta blocker, uh, the topical beta blockers might not be effective. Uh, alpha agonists, uh, they are contraindicated if MAV inhibitors are used. And uh, if estrozolamide is prescribed, we need to uh, ask for history of uh, sulfur allergy before giving the medication. Uh, moving on to examination, the important necessary resources are a slit lamp with indirect lens. 90-day examination is important. Then a Goldman-style applanation tonometer. Shiots is uh, generally not acceptable. A gonio lens that allows the indentation gonioscopy is important. Then besides this, the ultrasound pachymeter for CCT, automated perimeter, and uh, OCT for RNFL, GCIPL analysis. So this, uh, these are the important routine uh, uh, tests for the workup of glaucoma. Uh, in the anterior segment examination, uh, so we look for conjunctival inje injection, papillae or follicles, that is VKC, we will have to rule out because such patients might be on chronic um, uh, steroid uh, eye drops. 
And in the cornea, you look for pigments on the corneal endothelium. Then peripheral anterior chamber depth uh, by Van Heyrick's technique should be assessed. And also important is the central anterior chamber depth, evidence of inflammation. And in ch uh, children, uh, look for hat stray and uh, measure the corneal diameter. So uh, see for evidence of uh, ocular surface disease in uh, chronic uh, in patients on chronic eye drops and pseudo exfoliation on the endothelium and lo uh, also look for signs of previous refractive surgery. In the iris, you have to look for mid dilated or poorly reactive pupil, patchy atrophy or spiraling. Rubiosa, sinicae, ectropion, uva and sphincter ruptures will point towards uh, secondary causes. Then you have to rule out, uh, see for, a pre for the presence of iridotomy or iridectomy and pseudo exfoliation uh, may be seen on the pupil edge. Transillumination defects, if it's peripupillary, suspect PXF, uh, uh, in pigment dispersion you see mid peripheral defects and uh, loss of pupillary uh, rough is an early sign of PXF. In, uh, and also displaced pupil with iris atrophy or hole will point towards eye syndrome or accent field rigor. And also sometimes uh, you have to look for leash nodules in neurofibromatosis. In lens, see for PXF material, lens opacity, phacodonesis, glaucom flecken and early PXF changes um, uh, which might be visible after pupil dilation. Uh, gonioscopy, uh, it's a forgotten art. So it, this is important in any glaucoma workup. It detects uh, angle closure and secondary glaucomas. The angle width and characteristics are noted. And initially it's done for all and repeated more frequently for patients with angle closure. And uh, the technique, uh, uh, minimum room illumination, good anesthesia and uh, dim slit illumination can't be overstressed. And look for the visibility of the scleral spur and then uh, label the um, angle accordingly. An optic nerve head examination is the uh, is a very important uh, clinical examination with slit lamp biomicroscopy. This defines the presence of glaucoma. This has already been uh, uh, presented by Dr. Chandramya Paul. I will not uh, go further on it. Then uh, exam uh, investigations, the optic disc imaging, the sensitivity and specificity for glaucoma diagnosis for three technologies that is HRT, OCT and GD GDX is approximately 80%. And the uh, 2016 WGA consensus states that OCT measurement of RNFL thickness may be the best amongst uh, the uh, others like HRT and GDX. Visual field examination, it defines the state of optic nerve function and if glaucoma is progressing or not. So this is the one which defines the visual impairment. So automated perimeter should be done with machines that have appropriate normative database. And ideally, uh, the same program is preferable for uh, um, uh, uh, follow-up visits and when glaucoma suspected tests should be performed more frequently uh, I mean uh, once you diagnose glaucoma the, in the initial first two years at least six tests uh, uh, are recommended to ascertain the baseline and rate of um, progression and it's very important to understand that the correct procedure for performing uh, visual field testing and in the follow-up to uh, uh, that's a very important uh, uh, thing because glaucoma being a chronic progressive disease uh, with lifelong uh, management so follow-up is plays a very important role and uh, this uh, the aim of follow-up is to implement the glaucoma management plan and then to detect uh, the progression and rate of change and uh, in medical management the efficacy of the drug and to monitor compliance in surgical management to assess the functionality uh, of the performed surgical procedure and to adjust the post-op uh, medication and um, uh, when follow-up the initial follow-up should be more frequent to detect the rate of progression and uh, generally uh, the frequent follow-ups are recommended for uh, more severe damage uh, more, the greater the risk factors the faster the rate of progression and in surgical uh, follow-ups and the uh, follow-up uh, time would be uh, uh, annually or um, by an, uh, uh, once in two years in glaucoma suspect in mild cases six to twelve months once and in moderate cases and stable cases four to six months and in severe uh, glaucoma or one-eyed patients you can follow up one to four months uh, uh, and that is it thank you thank you very much that was a excellent talk which you gave I would want Dr. Vinay Nangya to take this question and then connect his presentation um, uh, what is your approach to a pre perimetric glaucoma? Is the mic? Mic.
I do need to see something uh, on the optic disc, on the retinal fibrillar, on the ganglion cell. And if I do find something on the retinal fibrillar or ganglion cell, then I would not use the term any longer preferentially. It'll be good. It gives you a sense as if you're not sure of what's happening actually. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, sir, when you're uh, setting up your talk, uh, I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Pandav, sir. So for the benefit of the viewers, how would you measure or target, um, calculate the target IOP range? And what factors would you look into because it's a dynamic figure in that course of the treatment? Uh, I think, uh, <coughs> again, target IOP is kind of very individualized for uh, every patient. And the factors y you mentioned, uh, we had look at the age of the patient. You had look at the corneal, uh, you yes. know, biomechanics. They call it thickness, basically. Uh, how advanced the disease is uh, is a mild, moderate, or se severe disease. Yes. Uh, expected uh, life expectancy is very hard to calculate, but uh, you know, some sort of thing. Uh, the visual field effect, how much is that? And I think based on that, you kind of take yes. a uh, call whether it's a mild or moderate or severe disease, and you know, keeping other factors yes. in mind. So if you have a severe disease, you would like to have you know, like to have IOP on the lower teens, I would say roughly. So there are nomograms, mm -hmm. and there's no one standard formula for this, yeah. but uh, there are some uh, nomograms available. And in percentage term, also you you could reduce aim at reducing to 30 percent at least uh, in if there is severe disease. And but it's a mild to moderate, uh, you could be somewhere uh, in between. So at least 20 percent maximum. Mm -hmm. 30 plus mm -hmm. percentage, so that would be required and some something in between. But then you have to look at uh, you know yes, the multiple yes, factors. Yes, thank you so much. Yes. I wanted that to be stressed. Thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to Dr. Vinay Nangya. Uh, you have been introduced. You were not there, so thank I'm going to skip so that. Yes. I mean, we're truly delighted to have you with us, sir. And uh, he is going to be talking on visual fields and OCT. You are ready, Rekna, for the choice of strategy and progression analysis. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chitra, and to the AIOS. I'm delighted to be here today. I'm going to take you through a very short presentation on the preferred practice patterns. And um, I was wondering what to write and what to talk to you, and I thought the best thing to do was to visit the consensus because there's a lot of effort that's gone into the consensus at the WGA, actually. And my contribution really is showing you what the consensus, how it applies practically to the photographs and the patients that I'm showing you, actually. So the clinical diagnosis of glaucoma is based on the detection of a thin retinal nerve fiber layer and a narrowed neuroretinal rim. And the thin retinal nerve fiber layer and neuroretinal rim are the current day gold standards actually. So the diagnosis of glaucoma does not always require the detection of visual field defects and that's just what we were discussing with regard to the preperimetric glaucoma. But perimetry is indispensable for documentation and monitoring of functional decline in glaucoma. So you can see here that this is a retinal nerve fiber layer defect that co you know, correlates with the retinal nerve fiber layer here. Imaging technologies including optical coherence tomography provide an objective and quantitative approach to detect. So of all the tech, you know, technologies that have come out, the OCT has really stood the test of time and it is definitely the best currently available uh, you know, digital imaging instrument uh, for all glaucoma specialists for the structural damage in glaucoma. And RNFL thickness is the most clinically helpful parameter of the ones currently available with OCT. And um, again, you can see here the large patch, the broad patch of wedge here, retinal nerve fiber layer defect, and this, you know, large wedge in the retinal nerve fiber layer that you can see here. But of course, we also have the macular ganglion cells, and it's a general impression that perhaps it's a good thing to do the, GS, uh, the GCL in the macula so that then you're able to correlate the retinal nerve fiber layer with the GCL and the GCL also gives you an impression almost like the perimetry in the central you know six to seven degrees that it covers the deviation maps that it covers so it gives you an impression and helps you correlate the two structural changes and further fortify your decision making actually. But there are many pitfalls of OCT and one of the most important is artifacts and false segmentation. And you know, this is a patient where really the retinal nerve fiber layer has bottomed out. And so you'll get segmentation errors and you will not be able to follow up. So this is the time when you say the retinal nerve fiber layer is unlikely to be you know, significantly helpful to you. The second photograph is that of a, uh, of a ganglion cell uh, deviation map. And uh, the difficulty here is because of the structure of the fovea, 
you know, the central area, which is not supposed to have ganglion cells, has expanded a little bit. So that's got something to do with the foveal characteristics, the dimensions of the fovea, and then that causes difficulty in assessing uh, the deviation map, actually. That is something that we should remember. In myopic eyes also, we have difficulty with the retinal nerve fiber layer, and you can see this photograph of a high myope with significant uh, retinoschisis, which is not uncommon in high myopic eyes, and then of course the segmentation is not going to be regular and therefore you have difficulty with these patients actually. As far as the visual fields are concerned, we know, and, and my colleague uh, Dr. Suhasini has covered, that they should be reliable, defects should be reproducible and consistent with structural optic nerve damage, and the glaucoma hemifield test, the pattern standard deviation, these are all important for uh, the diagnosis of glaucoma. Standard white on white perimetry is fine and you should do a central 24 degrees field or a 30 degrees field and you should use the 10-2 strategy uh, and I will just come to you about uh, the 10-2. This is the 12 degree visual field that we, that we use on our octopus machine and you can see uh, that this is just a central area and, and it gives you an impression of how close the visual field loss has gone to the center of the fovea and that's the importance actually. So this is again a 12 degree field and a 30 degree field and this, this tells you that when you do a 12 degree you're concentrating more on the central part of the macula and the importance is that we know that we're worried about the patient not losing central vision. We also know that about 50 to 60 percent retinal nerve fiber layer loss has already happened in patients that come to us with glaucoma uh, in our clinics. And we also know that often the first area to get damaged is the most vulnerable zone that's just below the macular segment and, and, and in between the macular segment and the inferior temporal segment actually. And that then impinges straight on the ganglion cell layer in the central six degrees actually, which is what this visual field covers. And that's why we are now beginning to believe that, that most patients or almost all patients with glaucoma should always have a central macular visual field in association with the 24 or 30 degree visual field actually. So with current technology, detection of structural defects generally precedes detectable functional defects in glaucoma. And you know, of course, this is not a classical example of that, but just for structure functional correlation, you can see the optic disc damage correlating with the retinal nerve fiber layer notch. And this is the ganglion cell layer, and you can see how closely it has come to the fovea. This is the deviation map actually. And then again, at the 12 degree, you can see how vividly it captures the, the loss of visual field and how close it is to the fovea versus the 30 degree field that you see here actually. And this is a patient that I had when we done multiple retinal nerve fiber layer values over a long period of time and you get this regression here that shows you how the deterioration of the retinal nerve fiber layer has taken place. But every time that you do a retinal nerve fiber layer, please make sure that the segmentation, because the segmentation can change, you know, from one test to other actually. Therefore, we will always look at the retinal nerve fiber layer here like this actually. And uh, this is the Hoods report. I'm sure many of you know about it. It's, it's very, very, I think, important just to understand what this is all about. And uh, I may take just, maybe this is the last slide actually. So what it does is instead of having the nasal fibers here, it brings the macular fibers center. And that's very important actually because you need to see the macular fibers because you're worried about the macular fibers because they serve central vision. And uh, it's also very important that, uh, that uh, you know, this is the uh, ganglion cell loss. This is the deviation map. So it flips the retina, actually. So what it's done is, though the loss is inferior, it's flipped the retina superior. So the ganglion cell loss is appearing superiorly, and it flips the retina so that it matches with the visual field loss because the superior visual field loss is related to inferior damage, actually. So this way, you'll get the ganglion cell loss matching with the, with the loss uh, of the visual field, actually. So they may, uh, preferred practice patterns may differ depending on the patient and the practice. And this is just a basic guideline that helps you meet the needs of appropriate treatment. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. I mean, you made it so. I think, as far as glaucoma is concerned, that six minutes is a, I something. It'll always be there. So the one question I would want our next. Yeah. Yes. We have started doing that, Doctor Shantanu.
I, I believe that it is very important because often in what we consider to be early glaucoma, what we consider to be early glaucoma may have nothing to do with the closeness of the damage to the fovea actually. These are two separate things actually. So the closeness of the glaucomatous damage, initial glaucomatous damage to the fovea is what is very important to detect and to really get a vivid picture that you know we're, we're getting so close to the fovea. That is what should define how we're going to set the target pressure and how we're going to treat the patient actually. Is it follow, follow every time? Yes, always actually. I would want one question. Thank you very much, Doctor. I would want Dr. Mayuri to answer, ask this, uh, answer this question. Between GPA and OVR overview, which would you rank better and why? GP I prefer to do uh -huh. because it has both event-based event. analysis as mm -hmm. well as trend-based analysis. Yes. So yes. it should be used uh, as, a as a routine. Yes. yes. And yes. that's why in the first follow-up only, I do two at least two baselines, uh -huh. correct baselines, both for visual field as well as the imaging. And then subsequently, if we can do faster, six fields in two years may be difficult yes. in private practice. But try to get as many as you can. Okay. And ma'am, does it really correlate well with the uh, analysis on the OCT yes. also? Yes, always, yes. always. And as Dr. Nagya said, I have started using 10-2 more often these days, not only the 24-2. But then we have a very yes. narrow yes. database. Sometimes one pick says something is abnormal, but if you go by that finding alone, it may not be so. Because I, I initiate, the, whether the fields or the OCT, the yes. database is too narrow, yes. so and that is not all of them are an Indian population. That's so why it should be repeatable, uh, consistent change. Dr. Vijaya? In terms of 10-2, uh, the missions have come out with uh, incorporating the extra 24-2C. The only mm. thing problem is uh, that is available only in the later models. If you are, you cannot use it, you, it won't give meaningful information if you're using it for the follow-up. At least for the new patient, you can start off with that and continue, continue to do that. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ne. Look forward to having you back as expert panel. And we, sh we are truly lucky to have Dr. B. Shanta, who's a senior consultant, the Department of Glaucoma Services at Shankar Netraya. Again, a very veteran surgeon and a very senior glaucomatologist. And she's going to be talking on preferred practice guidelines and comprehensive algorithm guiding initial medical management of glaucoma. On to you, Dr. Shanta. The next speaker uh, to be ready is Dr. Harsh Kumar. Uh, just an information. And um, you can start. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. So the key goals of medical management of glaucoma is to preserve vision while maintaining the quality of life. And the most significant risk factor which can be treated remains persistently elevated intraocular pressure. So to what extent should IOP be lowered? The target IOP that you're trying to achieve would depend on the baseline IOP, disc and field changes, the rate of progression, and the quality of life as well as the life expectancy. The baseline IOP can be obtained from patients' old records and patients already on treatment, if possible from a diurnal variation at the office or over 24 hours, especially for presumed normal tension glaucoma. To what extent should IOP be lowered in ocular hypertension? The OHGS has showed us that at least a 20% targeted uh, reduction in IOP reduce the risk of progression from 4.4% in the treated group versus 9.5% in the no treatment group. Similarly, the early manifest glaucoma treatment trial showed us that at least 25% uh, drop in IOP reduced progression in 45% of the treated versus 62% in the no treatment group. And the collaborative initiated glaucoma treatment trial showed us that 35 to 48% reduction in moderate and severe glaucoma brought the mean progression to almost zero during the follow-up. These numbers are rough guidelines. Established target ranges than a single number and constantly reset the target to e each individual depending on the therapeutic response and the rate of progression of glaucomatous damage. So which drugs would you choose? There are drug factors and patient factors as uh, mentioned here. Drug efficacy you have to look at in terms of drop in intraocular pressure, in terms of reduction of diurnal variation and the duration of effect. So this is a nice meta-analysis which looks at the IOP lowering effects of individual drugs. So something between 15 to 23% drop is seen with these drugs. Timolol comes interim, and the PJ analogs give the best drop in IOP. If you look at the diurnal control of IOP also, the PJ analog score of the other drugs with the beta blockers coming in between. If you look at safety issues, again, the ocular safety, the PJ analogs do a little better, 
uh, though you do get some conjunctival hyperemia. And with systemic uh, tolerability issues also, the PJ unlocks scope. So when you start therapy, establish a baseline, start with monotherapy, choose the drug according to the treatment being, uh, the condition being treated, remember the systemic medications and disorders, the target IOP required, the simplest regimen possible with the least adverse effects, and remember the contraindications. So as a case in point for a 39-year-old male with IOP around 25 to 26 open angles, and you can see that the right eye disc is fairly okay, the left eye shows a nerve fiber layer defect, so this is a early glaucoma you could require at least a 25% drop in IOP. So you have a choice of either non-sective beta blockers or PG analogs. So we did a monocular therapeutic trial for this patient. In the left eye, since there was a nerve fiber layer defect there, and you can see that there was a significant difference between the uh, two eyes. The second case is a patient who's around with IOP around 24 and 26, hypertensive on calcium channel blockers. This was the disc and uh, field changes, about a moderate glaucoma. We started off with Trimalol, got a 25% drop in IOP, but over a period of five years, the IOP started creeping up, so we changed to latinoprost. There was progression, so we uh, combined timolol and latinoprost over the next few years. And you can see that the patient continued to progress, though slowly. So we changed to a combination therapy with timolol and bromonidine and continued latinoprost. So points illustrated are first substitute, then add, reset the target, use combination therapy wherever possible, follow up with visual fields at least once in six months, and redefine the baseline visual field at the appropriate time. Systemic medications, you have to remember, since systemic beta blockers are less effective in, uh, topical beta blockers are less effective when systemic beta blockers are being used, and may actually adverse, increase adverse effects such as nocturnal hypotension. And uh, many of our patients are elderly on multiple drugs, and systemic uh, drug interaction is possible. We also need to remember the drugs do not work for those who do not use them. So persistent by drug class, again, the PG analogs, uh, PG analogs go. The patients on latinoprost did better than those on uh, beta blockers in uh, maintaining their therapy. Is mechanism of action a consideration? You try to pair drugs which complement each other in action. Those which decrease aqueous production should be combined with those which increase outflow either through the trabecular meshwork or through the US cradle outflow pathway. So these are the advantages of combination therapies. Increase compliance, re equal efficacy as the individual constituents, reduce the washout effect from rapid sequential application of the additional medications, and reduce load of preservatives. And these, are, we have a large armamentarian now in India as well. But is medical treatment really benign? A lot of our patients over a period of time develop ocular surface disease, which can go as high as 48 to 50%, increases with the increasing number of medications being used, and increased prevalence in elderly patients with dry eye disease. So we have preservative field medications now, and they have to found to be as efficacious as the preserved medication. So what is maximum medical treatment? Ultimately, patients will require multiple medications to control the IOP. So this is the minimum number and concentration of drugs which give you the maximum drop in IOP with the least side effects. Usually, it is a maximum of three drugs. Use of a fourth drug only gives additional drop of IOP of about 15 to 20% in 40 to 60% of patients at single time points, but has poor long-term effect. So once a fourth medication is, need, is needed, you have to uh, uh, inform the patient that over a period of time, the next step in treatment is required, either laser trypeclopathy or surgery, depending on the individual scenario. These are some of the newer drugs in our armamentarium now. We have uh, the ROC inhibitors, which increase trabecular outflow. We have combinations of ROC inhibitors with latinoprost. The conjunctival hyperema is a problem with all of them. So in conclusion, establish a baseline, establish a target IOP, teach nas nasal acrim duct occlusion to prevent the side effects, substitute with more efficacious drugs in case of inadequate effect, and use combination drugs when more than one drug is needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shanta, that was an amazing talk. One question to you, Dr. Vijaya. A patient with very advanced glaucoma, he's on all the medicines. You, it looks as if uh, doing a surgery is sort of, it, you might have a, rarely have a snuff out kind of a scenario. But his fields have not progressed. But the IOP is looking, uh, could have been lower. What would you do when you're stuck in such a situation, more so with the pilocarpine not being available now? How do you deal with those segments yeah. of patients? Good news is this pilocarpine started, started yesterday. We yeah. got the stocks. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I wasn't, uh, yeah, anyway, I think um, yeah, this is that is progressing. Uh, Fields is not progressing. 
but the pressures are but the pressures when they are come for a it's checkup because so enough time before it progresses if yes. you if you keep the intraocular yes. pressure on higher side yeah. it's just a question of time, time before it progresses and uh, we know very well that you need a low pressure with uh, advanced glaucoma yeah. you have to educate the patient take all the precautions be prepared for the surgery no would you do for a go for any of the laser procedures yeah, let me tell you that laser procedures if patient is already had so many medications with advanced disease don't expect a miracle to happen you can give it trial a slt done at the beginning of the disease will have a, a better effect in long term rather than an eye which was having the disease which is on multiple medications for longer period of time adding yeah. slt may not yield that amount of reduction you can give a trial to prime the patient for the possible surgery in future. SLT is not going to hamper your surgical process. Uh, Dr. Sat, yes, sorry. Can I just, you know, Shanta is here and yes. she's done some work on snuff out. Yeah. You know, yes, Dr. Shanta. It's a little bit overrated, but yes. let's have her talk to us. Yes, Dr. Shanta. Yeah, I think the original uh, definition of snuff out was that it was an idiopathic loss of central vision. Mm. But now we find that with uh, SSOCT being available, we are able to make out that most of the time it's hypotony maculopathy which is yes. causing the snuff out. Yes. Clinically, it may not be visible, but uh, so if we avoid hypotony and take care, you can take care of all these uh, split Dr. Fixations. Shishmita. There's no need to tell the patient, scare the patient and uh, we can go ahead with surgery taking the maximum precautions yes, possible. Yes, yes. Thank you so yes, much for that. You. Uh, Dr. Satyan, I wanted to ask you a question. A lot of times patients show allergies to various uh, topical drugs, especially brimonidine plus they have, suppose it's an advanced glaucoma and the target pressure is really low and they have ocular side effects like ocular surface disorder. So do you add lubricants or do you, and sometimes when you need three or four drugs and they are allergic to them or do you think surgery is the only option to them? Now once they are allergic to medications, yeah, you just give it for some time, it's not going to be useful. So my best option is to go for the surgical so yeah. I mean, if it is really required. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, doctor. You know, if you, if you get an allergy, uh, one of the things that we often do is we stop the medications, actually. Yeah. And we found that in some of these, uh, and we do put the patient on, uh, on, on topical steroids, actually. Yeah. You know, mild topical steroids. And you still have a period where the pressure will not suddenly shoot up, actually. There will be, you know, maybe two, three weeks where the pressure doesn't shoot up actually. And this gives you time and, uh, you know, for the conjunctiva to recover and for the lids to recover. And then you can change the medication and restart again to see how it works out. Not always when you restart, he will come back with the same allergy. Yes. You know, so mm. these are things that one, one could consider instead of uh, immediately making a decision of, and, and as al almost, not always, but almost is a routine. We tend to give uh, lubricants to patients yes. who are on one or more, no more uh, drugs. Yeah. Yes. And I think we have started respecting rock inhibitors a lot more since pilocarpine went out for a bit. I think it is showing its performance. I'm not taking that question on that. And uh, also, also sometimes because of the preservative related, so it might yes. be useful yes. to use a preservative free, preservative free medication. Free medication. Yes. Yes. Uh, we are truly thankful to Dr. Harsh Kumar. Uh, who's the director of glaucoma services of Center for Sight uh, uh, Group of Hospitals. Again, an amazing glaucomatologist and has held many senior posts in the GSI. Thank you so much, Dr. Harsh Kumar, for being with us and a big support for us. And he's going to be talking on preferred practice guidelines, systemic workup in glaucoma, the when, what, and how. On to you. Uh, thank you, Chitra, for having me in this fast-forward mode. <laughs> So if Sorry. you wanted to check, how, uh, who will going to stumble This is first? all the time Patha gives. Yes, so. yes, <laughs> I know that. So uh, whether systemic workup is required or not, uh, actually eye is the only way where you can look into the heart and into your soul and into your body. So yes, you must. There is no question that you have to look into it. And simple things, uh, just high BP, I think most of us have already got it. So it will invariably <laughs> relate to your... <laughs> So uh, it will uh, lead definitely to high intraocular pressure, high, and we know that CRVOs can be produced. So obviously we have to look at the high BP, but we are more and more worried about hypotension. As more and more of our patients come with NTG, we realize that, that the ocular perfusion has to be good. If it is not good, then we are in trouble and nocturnal BP fall 
of more than 10% is definitely associated with both advanced functional visual field deficits and greater structural damage. So what we are now routinely doing in most of our patients are 24-hour BP monitoring and invariably we add on the whole term monitoring with it, especially in patients who are on antihypertensives because these are the people who will get night dips and then they'll get unexplained progression. So please be very careful, get a 24-hour BP monitoring done and then if the BP is dropping below 70, you have to speak to the cardiologist. You cannot tell the patient to speak to the cardiologist, they will not listen to them. And the cardio doesn't understand what is going on. Most of our patients are one-eyed. If they get into this kind of a trouble, we are in trouble. So we have to reduce their antihypertensives. Another important thing which has come up is the obstructive sleep apnea. So who are these people? These are people who will get at least 1.7 times greater chances of developing glaucoma or a fibro period. And these people are usually fat with a double chin and <coughs> they usually snore loudly. So these are the things that you ask for. And then they get into incomplete sleep, depression, fatigue, morning headaches. And there are so many other things besides glaucoma then that can be associated here, which I really didn't know about. And uh, so basically what is happening is hypoxia, hypercapnia, reduction of ocular perfusion, going into glaucomatous optic atrophy. But the biggest thing is that if you do a sleep study and you put them on CPAP machines, they can be alleviated. So really this is something which is a game changer. Obviously, we do all look for diabetes, migraine, thyroid because we know they are associated in some ways. But the newer things which are coming up are the CSF pressure. Unfortunately, we don't have non-invasive techniques still to detect that. But we do know that if the CSF pressure is low, there could be a, uh, along the lamina cribrosa, there could be a gradient which can really get us into trouble. And very, very important for all DENTG patients to get into a complete systemic workup. Again, perfusion pressures. You have to check for arrhythmias, hyperviscosity, hyperlipidemias. You have to check for the history of major injuries and surgeries uh, where blood may have been lost. MRIs are important because sometimes you land up with pituitary tumors giving a picture just like that. If you have increased episcleral venous pressure, it could be related to venous obstruction, AV anomalies. So scleritis, thyroid, orbital tumors, superior vena cava syndrome, keratocaver fistulas and the list goes on and on and yes it could be idiopathic as well. So obviously you do a MRI brain and orbit and really it reveals so many secrets to you. Especially in systemic diseases, Sturge Weber syndrome, you can see a tram track and MR angiography can help you diagnose AV malformations which can actually help you to save a life later. Again MRI brain and orbit can will give you a tumor as well. The neovascular glaucomas, we usually always said that it was diabetic and CRVOs which used to get them, but more and more often I think you people will be seeing that too. We are getting ocular ischemic syndromes where these two diseases are not present. And then we have to really do a systemic workup to check up the carotid occlusive disease because one can do an end artrectomy and really get away with it. So there are so many other things that there is a huge list and there is no way in six minutes I am going to finish that. So all these things need to be checked up properly and all these uh, tests need to be done. Again, ubiquitic glaucoma, the important thing over here is that you have to do all these tests, HLA, B27, B51, ANA, RA factors. The one thing only I want to emphasize is that at least three patients in the recent past I've seen being treated at premier institutions going on for months and months and uh, the uvi is not getting treated they are on steroids and anti-metabolites nobody bothered for a very very detailed history we did a pet scan and they blew up like a christmas tree for god's sake in cases of uvi which are not being treated if you do a pet scan and you treat you catch them early it may be life-saving again uh, infective disease like sarcoid tuberculosis syphilis etc we all know in axonfield riggers, please concern the CVS abnormalities and other skeletal abnormalities must be looked at. In aniridia, serial renal ultrasound can be life-saving if you detect the Wilms tumor in time. So in conclusion, not only it gives you a direction to manage if you do a good systemic workup, but please and definitely it can be life-saving. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Harsh. You covered so much in the six minutes. Thank you so much. A uh, question which I have now is, um, what would be the 
Dr. Shishmita, role of 24-hour BP monitoring in glaucoma management. I mean, I want the audience to understand uh, what already Dr. Harsh had reiterated. So especially um, my uh, first uh, indication would be somebody who's progressing despite pressures which I think Dr. Swati Upadhyay. Which yeah. I thought was normal. Yeah. So unexplained progression, yes. uh, which is not uh, related to his performance, not related to pressures, I thought would be. So that where that's where I have found these nocturnal dips, in fact. I have also found a, a consistent low pressure and uh, got them worked up and they had carotid stenosis. So sometimes when you send them to a cardiologist, they would say, uh, carotid stenosis, 20% are insignificant. In, we write back to them, it's insignificant for, for you. you, but it's significant in the sense of a normal tension glaucoma. Maybe it has tipped the balance to lower perfusion anyway. Yes. So that's where my primary indication would be. Yes. Uh, Dr. Pandav, uh, we, uh, OSA was discussed so beautifully by Dr. Harsh. But you know, there are no RCTs which tell us and when we do this uh, OSA test, many of them are found to have mild moderate disease. So how is it going to change your management at that point of I time? Think some of these patients are definitely, uh, they have, uh, you know, you look at the patient profile, I think he, uh, Hirsch did mention yeah. about the obese double chin patients and they are kind of a, yes. uh, you know, kind of feel sleepy actually during daytime and they don't have good quality of the sleep is not actually good during yeah. night. Yeah. And uh, we do refer these patients uh, uh, especially if their glaucoma is not getting, uh, you know, control, if they're still progressing. So I have, uh, you know, some patients, so we actually have a sli sleep clinic now in, uh, in the institution and we regularly refer these patients to sleep clinic to have a further detailed. And we do find, uh, you know, many of these patients, they come with a uh, significant amount of sleep apnea. Now it's very hard to kind of, a, uh, you know, say at what level mild, yes. moderate, severe, what level yes. it will affect the glaucoma because each individual is different. But someone who has it, we treat him as a potential cause and uh, our ENT people, they advise, you know, what can be done to improve the breathing uh, at yes. night. Thank you, thank you. We shall now go on to Dr. Swati Upadhyay, who is a medical consultant glaucoma services from Arvind Eye Care Systems from Pondicherry. And I'm sure she's going to do great justice to her talk on preferred practice guidelines, universal safe surgery system for trabeculectomy in glaucoma pain. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, AOS. And I am such feeling so honored to be in front of, speaking in front of so many glaucoma legends, I should say. So if I do any mistake, please forgive me. Oh, wow. So I'll be talking on preferred practice guidelines, a universal safe surgery system for trabeculectomy in glaucoma management. So when do we do a trab? Is it is based the decision is based on magnitude and duration of pressure elevation, the extent and progression of visual field damage, the extent of damage to the ONH, and patient's own sense of visual function and co course of the contralateral eye and the general health and expectancy life expectancy of the patient. So Peng Ho has given very good uh, safe trap technique. So it says that you should have a large treatment area. You should have a posteriorly directed flow of aqueous. You should have tight adjustable sutures, large scleral flap and not cut to the limbus, which is very, very important and a single scleral punch sclerostomy. So I'll take you through all these ones one by one. So previously we used to do brittle suture and when we do a trap with the uh, SACS with IOL implantation, we take a brittle suture which should be sh uh, short and crisp bite of the superior rectus and it should you should avoid taking a large area of the conjunctiva and should be done under direct vis visualization through the microscope as it can cause button holding of the conjunctiva and very rarely perforation. But now we have switched on to corneal traction suture which is because it is more safer, it is less damaging to the conjunctiva. You can either take a superior uh, uh, traction suture or you can take an inferior traction suture. The, if you have a deep uh, bite, then you can have an inadvertent AC entry which can lead to infection. If you have a very superficial bite, you can have cheese wiring of the cornea. So it should be just in the center or you should have a, with practice you should come there, it should go only half thickness of the stroma. Then comes peritomy. Use as much as possible non-traumatic sutures or non-tooth forceps, uh, uh, forceps for the conjunctival handling in trap and it should be just needed conjunctival dissection. Uh, if you should not open up the whole 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock conjunctival if you are doing a phaco trap to inside. 
uh, because if the uh, if you are doing a trab SICS also, your minimum optic size will be 6.5. So just open around say 6.5 to 7 millimeters of the conjunctiva. We normally favor fornix space flap because it prevents the ring of steel formation. Conjunctiva should be handled as gently as possible, and you should do a sufficient backward dissection to make scleral pockets for the MMC sponges to be put. Excessive dissection will lead to a large blip or if scarred and failed then one may find difficult to perform a repeat trabeculectomy. Cautery should be just adequate to cauterize all the bleeders which might come in your way when you are doing a scleral fab dissection. Excessive cautery can, be, can lead to shrinkage of the sclera and later reapproximation of the scleral fab might be difficult. We normally use a unipolar cautery or a pencil or a lipstick cautery. MMC application and wash is very very important so in, this is avoided in patients with myopia in patients with normal tension glaucoma and, uh, uh, and when you have an over filtration in the other eye you can uh, still use a lesser concentration of MMC so normally we use 0.02 percent MMC duration is for two minutes so this is placing sponges uh, merosal sponges under the conjunctiva and it is being pushed into the scleral pockets we had uh, the conjunctival pockets we had made during conjunctival dissection you can also use MMC injection which can be 0.1 ml of MMC and plus 0.1 ml of lignocaine. <coughs> Scleral flap dissection, we, uh, we normally use 4 into 4 or 4 into 3 millimeter flap size. The base is 4 millimeters and the maximum height is like 4 millimeters. We are not going up to the limbus as you can see in the video. The blue, we start at the blue zone so that blue zone 1 millimeter area is still there and it prevents leakage from the sides of the uh, of the edges so we should avoid going uh, at the limbus totally towards the limbus leave one millimeter gap then the thickness of the flap should be one third of or, or to half of the thickness of the sclera and if you can see it is if you're having a thick flap how will we identify we will see the underlying brownish pigmentation of the ciliary body so we should change our plane and be come to a, a more uh, superior, superior superior plane Attempt should be made to avoid a scleral flap of equal. Uh, attempt should be made to obtain a scleral flap of equal thickness throughout. It should not be a ragged flap. You should check the blade, 50 number blade, so that it should be sharp. You should not have ragged uh, uh, incisions and ragged uh, cores when you make the flap. And handle with non-tooth or serrated forceps. Make a side port incision. It should be very guarded. More so in primary or angle closure glaucoma cases, we should not do a sudden decompression of the anterior chamber because then it might lead to uh, aqueous misdirection later in post-operative period. We normally use super sharp blade or a 15 gauge side port knife, and blade should be parallel to the iris and enter only half length of the blade. Then comes the AC entry and inner sclerostomy. We use a keratome and we do not use the whole the whole thickness of the whole length of the keratome. Just go half triangle and then come out so that it is a very controlled AC entry. This is a Kelly's Desmet's membrane punch which we use. If you don't have Kelly's Desmet's membrane punch, you can use a 11 number blade uh, blade also. And the make a small punch it can it, it is usually available in one millimeter and 0.75 millimeters also so if you have a normal tension glaucoma use a smaller size kelly sponge it should be held vertically to avoid any shelving of the tissue and you should not keep an, an angulation or at the side because it might lead to desmatch membrane detachment finally we come to iridectomy uh, it should be a broad basal iridectomy wider than the sclerostomy wound it will prevent iris incarceration in the sclerostomy wound and will prevent papillary block conjunctival closure water it should be watertight so that you don't have any leakage and for me for next base flap we use two wing sutures or mattress sutures and we anchor the first suture toward the episclera and after that we can either take con continuous as was shown earlier or we can take interrupted so we usually do interrupted we anchor at both the sides lastly ac deformation we should check uh, whether the bleb is forming sometimes bleb don't form on the table but it doesn't matter you should just form the ac tight so that your uh, you have a good margin and the patient do not have hypotony on the first post period if you want to check you can use two percent fluorescein or betadine eye drops to do serials on table thank you so much it's a wonderfully informative talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, one question uh, I'll take with Dr. Vijaya. How would you titrate the tightness of suture which he mentioned? I mean, some of us in the audience would want to know. 
Uh, I mean, before I go on to it, uh, let me tell you, trabeclectomy is a quite labor-intensive surgery. Everybody masters their own technique, what yes. works best in your hands. Yes. Yes. You can always share your tips with others. Yes. Ultimately, you have to master your technique. Yes. So what is important is uh, not leave the eye soft. Yes. So make sure you learn to feel the eyeball mm. using your finger. Yes. And make sure that your glove is tight on the finger and feel the eyeball. Make sure it is firm enough and leave. Yeah. And the second way of doing it is using the Merisol sponge. You can uh, dry the trabeclectomy site. And uh, without pressure, if there is too much of seepage, you are likely to have problems. With a little pressure, if there is seepage, that's fine. That's, that's when you leave yeah. the eye. Okay. Uh, Dr. Satyan, I would ask you, is there a role of attempting to suture the tenons also along with the conjunctiva in the conclusion of the surgery? Do you feel uh, that would prevent in making thin blebs? I'm something? not sure any of them are doing in uh, trabeclectomy surgeries, but hmm. I really don't do any tenons uh, sutures. Because it's not no, taking yeah. a bite of the tenon along and then Usually suture. We, take we do take. Yeah. 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 Anything, any one important point you'll want to add which she could have missed out though her talk was quite thorough, yes? And the last point is, uh, is it possible to atropine? Are you yeah. doing that? Atropine, yes, we all use oh, it yes. at the end of the surgery. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm not, yeah, I'm just uh, putting a cycloplegic of cohomide I would put, but yeah, atropine I'm not putting, but you all are putting yeah, atropine, all, all of you are. Just okay. to deepen the chamber. And yes. The yes, Dr. Suhas. Adjustable Releasable. He is asking adjustable sutures. The uh, no. Only thing is, I probably for the last uh, 10 years, I have been using only the absorbable sutures. It yeah. is 10 no monofilament uh, vicryl. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Kavita. Yeah. Yeah? She's, uh, no, no, it's okay, I can change it. Uh, no, no, I thought in the schedule that I saw here, the name was there. So I just no, wanted to, no, no, uh, yeah, yeah it's okay. Kavita yeah. is first, no, then you, can, you, you can no, you've already connected your laptop, it's okay, we, let's not waste time. And uh, we sh Dr. Kavita, you would go next, be ready. And I would want, when you start discussion, the next speaker to take, go to the thing, because I'm going crazy with the time thing. We have Dr. Sirisha Sendil again. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Sirisha. I feel as if I'm on a roller coaster right now. And with all so the top view Chitra here. Chitra needs a break. Yeah, I truly. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> no, but then how could I exclude all of you? I can't run a meeting like that. So she's again the heads the glaucoma uh, care at LV Prasad Eye Institute and uh, specialized in cataract, glaucoma, and children eye care. And she's going to talk again on an honest appraisal of the utility and techniques of mix and uh, micropulse laser in Indian scenario. On to you, Dr. Sirisha. Yeah, so I thought let me start with what these actually mean because some of us may not even know what this micropulse laser is. So what is micropulse and how different is it from the continuous wave diode laser that we use. So the laser mode that breaks up the continuous wave laser into short repetitive bursts. So basically in between there is a cooling off period and what that does is it decreases the amount of energy that is delivered and obviously a collateral damage. So in TSCPC we know we blast the ciliary uh, processes and you hear a pop whereas in the micropulse laser what you do is you use uh, a probe to sweep on the tissue of the uh, ciliary body more so of the uh, pars plana and it possibly gives a thermal effect. It causes a low-grade inflammation of the ciliary body. You don't hear any pops in this tissue, apparently. In fact, when I asked uh, Paul Chu, how does it work? He said, I don't know how it works. He said it works. We know that, we've seen that, but I cannot really tell you what the mechanism is. But people describe and hypothesize that it works like pilocarpine, where it helps to uh, work on the ciliary muscle fibers and possibly helps to open up the scleral spur in the trabecular spaces, but there are two versions of these uh, micropulse probes that we have. The currently uh, version two is being used. Uh, so the settings are based on multiple settings that have been used in various studies. Basically, the power is almost the same as what we use with the TSCPC machine, but I think the dwell time or the time that you use to sweep the probe is much shorter. So it is like a painting of a brush that you do on the superior quadrant and on the inferior quadrant in a sweeping motion, and that can be done either fast or slow. 
based on uh, what what is the what is recommended and what your results are in your hands so i try to gather up the evidence that is there for micropulse laser so it is very very confusing evidence some of them say they are fantastic some of them say it doesn't work some of them say there are just too many complications so i try to be honest in trying to gather what information we have so this was a study majority of the studies if you see are from the singapore group uh, this was our first study that was published where the results are closed in prospective study of 40 eyes success rate was 80% again the definition of success is IOP less than 21, more than 6, with or without anti glaucoma medication. So with medication, it is 80%. But we need to also remember that in their study, they, they did not consider repeat micropulse laser as uh, was not considered as failure. So which means that even if somebody required a repeat laser, it was still considered a success. This was a study that I came across where actually they compared the DLCP with the micropulse laser. At uh, one year, they found that their results at six months and one year, the results were slightly different at 60% and 40%. But by 18 months, there was no significant difference. Numbers were not huge though. Uh, but the ocular complication rates, according to them, the continuous wave had a little bit more complications. Again, when you have 48 patients and 48 eyes, when you say a little bit more is one, one more will be about 10% uh, more. So th it, that's how it is. That was the only study that I came across where there was a comparison, but there was a large study that was published by uh, a small a group where they looked at a retrospective study though, but multicentric, where they had looked at people with good visual acuity with no prior glaucoma surgery. How did the uh, micropulse laser work? So they found that the IOP reduction was not so great. By the last follow-up, it was only about 36%. But what was interesting is even the number of medications came down from 3.6 to 3.1. So there were not a significant drop in the medications, but what was also more interesting is more than one line drop in visual acuity was found in 42% of the eyes. So beware when you use this for people with good visual acuity. And more than three line loss was found in 50% of the eyes. Midriasis was a serious complication they found in several of these patients, which could be very difficult for some of our patients, if, especially if you are treating them for the first time and if they are young. And uh, some of these eyes also lost light perception. So with single surgery, about 36% success. Repeat surgery, about 60%, close to 60% success was what was found in their study. Um, so another study that again looked at these um, uh, 207 eyes, where again, if you see, it was almost similar to what we saw. Three years, it was 18% was the success rate. But this, what is uh, difficult to un uh, accept is the eyes that had thysis were seven. Meaning like even if it was, uh, let's say, 7 out of 207, in eyes that we're seeing, I think I wouldn't use this as the first option. There was this one study from India, uh, from Murali Ariga's group, uh, where hypotony was also noted, but uh, their success was quite good at three months. So to summarize, it is just an agent. I don't think you, I would use this as a primary procedure, especially considering the fact that hypotony and thysis are a serious issue. Cost is a problem because this is a single-use probe. So, Chitra, you have to give me two minutes more because you've given two topics. Trabeculectomy is the <laughs> no, gold I... standard. So, I don't want to go through all of this. We know MIGS is something that is uh, here for, uh, and I don't think we should run away from them. Newer technology, we should definitely uh, try and embrace it. But what is important is understand what is good and what is not so good and try to see uh, where we can use it to the benefit of our patients. There are several of these mixed procedures. I don't want to go into the details. Uh, mix are definitely increasing even in our country. Uh, they are different, slightly different in the sense like you're trying to use your uh, multiple methods uh, to try and improve the natural passages in the eye, apart from creating a um, passage that we otherwise do in a trabeculectomy or an implant surgery. Infronasal area has the maximum collector channels. There are various techniques that we do, at least in India. Since you specifically said for India, currently what we are doing is the uh, bang, KDB, uh, uh, goniotomy, the GAT, as well as the eye stent of, as of now that we have. Uh, the other procedures that are there, I'm not going to the details because we don't have them available in our country. A piece of evidence that I found was very useful, which all of us should understand is, any new technology we should adopt, but try and use the information that is available in the literature to see whether it, the long-term outcomes are good and does it really help your patient and what are the specific indications. So with eye stents, apart from high femur, what was very disturbing to note was close to 50% of the stents were embedded in the tissues that were uh, inserted. So that means they were malfunctional to begin with. So that is something that one needs to uh, understand and uh, uh, 
cataract formation of course is a I issue hyphema is a huge problem and for gat and for uh, the angle based procedures the trabectome and the kdb hyphema is a serious problem that we also deal with and iop spike is again a big problem so advanced glaucomas one, need, one should be very very careful in using these techniques it's not that we don't use but beware of this problem as well uh, the other subconjunctival procedures anything subconjunctival and you know, you're creating an artificial fistula or you're using a device to make a fistula hypotony and erosions are an issue as well so what do they have to offer us? They definitely help to decrease the uh, number of medications, possibly better safety. But remember one thing, just because they are safer, you don't have to use them because they also have to be effective. So a technique has to be used only if it is effective. And of course, affordability and the cost and availability is a serious issue. So at this point in time, I would say mix is great promise. There are no standardized definitions for success. They can be individualized and used based on the availability that we have. Plus, I think you need to taper your uh, use as per the requirement for the patient. Thank you. Thank you. Could you get connected? Uh, Dr. Shushmita, just one question. As there's no way of uh, imaging the collector channels, how would you prognosticate that your GAD surgery is actually successful? Prognosticate would be depending on the phenotype. For yeah. instance, I would assume that a JOAG would have a lesser outflow and I would I would be a little more guarded in telling the patient look I'm doing it but you might end up with a trap however steroid induced FA kick where I know it's it's an acquired trabecular problem I assume the collectors would be better so I'd be more uh, I mean yeah. better prognosticated that's yeah, the that's phenotype it. is what is going to direct thank you thank you thanks a lot Dr. Shirisha that was a wonderful talk and I'm sorry I'm putting pressure, but I essentially wanted, since this was the time, just the main pointers to be given to the audience so that they go home with a message. Uh, we have Dr. Kavita, who is a medical consultant, glaucoma services from Marvin Eye Care Systems, Pondicherry, and she's going to be talking on the consensus or controversies in glaucoma drainage devices. Uh, thank you, madam. Thanks for the introduction and the opportunity. So uh, let's arrive at a consensus on the controversies regarding the glaucoma drainage devices based on the evidence. And uh, I'm so happy that uh, most of the authors like uh, of these evidences are here to enlighten us more. So the first question, whenever we are talking about a tube is whether to consider a trap or a tube. So uh, as we all know, definitely trabeculectomy is the gold standard surgery, especially for the kind of advanced glaucoma we all get to see in our routine clinical practice. However, the downsides, uh, downsides of the trabeculectomy includes the risk of serious complications. It does not work in all types of glaucoma. And also we need a meticulous follow-up and uh, timely interventions to make the blep survive. And also, as discussed earlier, there is a chances of visual loss in these patients. So compared to trap, tubes have certain advantages because the results are more consistent, the bleb is located more posteriorly, and hence uh, lesser chances of bleb-related uh, complications, including endophthalmitis, and it needs less post-operative visits and interventions. So it is indicated in all types of refractory glaucoma, patients with scarred conjunctiva, and also in patients who have multiple failed glaucoma surgeries. So I have been uh, asked to show the technique also. We'll uh, rush through the technique quickly. A liberal uh, conjunctival incision is uh, made, which is like 90 to 100 or 110 degree, and relaxing cuts are placed. Uh, the superior rectus and the lateral rectus muscles uh, are isolated, and a space is created so that we can insert the foot plate of uh, the RD. So the device is checked for the patency and surface irregularity, and it is inserted under the muscle. Once it is under the muscle, we can see there is a change in the direction of the tube. So it is inserted under the muscles, after which we can check that free lateral movements will be possible and uh, the anterior movement uh, will not be possible. This is followed by fixation of the foot plate into the sclera using a nylon suture. Then the tube is uh, fixed to the sclera to prevent excess movements of the tube in the post-operative period. This is followed by the most important step the ligation suture, which is used uh, with a uh, 6 vicryl in 2-1-1 fashion. We should be very sure about uh, the integrity of the ligation. We always go for two ligation sutures uh, just to be on the safer side. And uh, this is followed by entering into the anterior chamber with a 23 gauge needle. And uh, the needle is slowly advanced into the anterior chamber, following which the tube is inserted. 
and if you are closer to the limbus it is better to use a patch graft or if you are like 4 millimeter away from the limbus we can use a patch free surgery also we use a partial thickness uh, corneal uh, patch and this is uh, fixed with a single box suture which is uh, followed by meticulous closure of the conjunctiva so the next question which will will uh, arise in our mind is whether to choose a valve device or non valve device so regarding the gdds in india bar valve as we know it's not available agv though available is costly now we have rd which is aurola backwards drainage implant which is a prototype of bar valve implant which is available at 50 us dollars and it has the potential to break the cost so whenever we have a device we should know the safety and the efficacy of the device uh, there are studies uh, which assess the intermediate term outcome and rd was uh, found to be safe and effective in controlling intraocular pressure both in adult and pediatric glaucomas and uh, the next question which we will get whether to choose a valve device or a non-valve device so these are studies in indian eyes which compared uh, AGV and RD and the surgical outcomes in the first year were comparable and with complete success rate was uh, higher in RD and the hypotony related complications were little more in RD. So this is uh, the long term success rates of uh, RD which again concluded the same and this is not only in adult population this was proven in pediatric eyes also the complete success was uh, more in RD so all these studies are done in Indian eyes. So the only worry which we will have when using an RD is at six weeks when the ligation suture gives way, uh, the patient, some patients might land up in hypertony, which is sometimes like uh, scary. So now we have the option of uh, partially occluding the tube. We have a uh, 3O like a uh, Supramed available from the Aurola. We, we can just create a small bevel in the suture, six to seven mm tip can be like a uh, suture bit can be taken. It can be inserted into the tube by making a small side port in the we can see it uh, smoothly goes into the tube so we should make sure that it should not the edge should not uh, protrude out of the tube the hypotony results in over two to three weeks time so the next question is whether to use a patch graft or we should use a patch free surgery so this uh, particular study analyzed that and they showed that uh, both are effective and uh, if we are entering four millimeter away from the limbus. If you are not too close to the limbus, we can avoid using a patch graft. So the next question will be whether to use a uh, supratemporal quadrant or infranasal quadrant. So again, uh, there are studies both in adult and uh, pediatric population. In adult population, there was not much of a difference. And this particular study, the second study in the pediatric population, they found that the complications were more in the infranasal quadrant in pediatric population, especially the tube exposure was uh, as, uh, significantly high. So they concluded that whenever in a pediatric population we are going for an RD, better to go for a supratemporal quadrant. Then we have dilemmas in tube insertion locations. So we can uh, uh, have an AC entry and we can insert into the ciliary sulcus or into the pars plana. So whenever the patient is uh, pseudophagic, we can make use of it inserting the tube into the ciliary sulcus. Uh, this is because uh, uh, the tube is much away from the cornea and uh, it needs to be a little longer and this will not uh, interfere with the patient's uh, vision. So the pars planar insertion can be considered in a patient like this, uh, uh, like uh, who had a corneal grafting and also needing a pars planar uh, procedure. We have to remember that uh, we need to do a complete pars, and pars planar vitrectomy before we decide to insert the tubes. And regarding uh, the safety, this was found to be safer in adult refractory glaucomas. And this particular study compared uh, the anterior chamber insertion with the posterior segment insertion. In both the studies, it was found that the complications were more with posterior segment insertion, especially the retinal detachment. So whenever possible, it is better to consider insertion into the anterior chamber. So to conclude, tubes are promising in refractory glaucomas. Both AGV and RD are good options. So whatever the surgeon is comfortable with, we can go for it. However, the studies in Indian eyes have shown better outcomes with RD. So patch graft is not mandatory if we are entering four millimeter away from the limbus and uh, the tube should be always positioned away from the cornea. Better to prefer anterior chamber placement rather than a posterior segment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kavita. I think we we'll, I wouldn't know whom to give the prize for the best uh, speaker in the six minutes each to beat the other. Ja, while Dr. Satin is connecting, it's like just one question I would ask Dr. Yeah. Uh, if the first tube is to fail, 
Yeah, if the first tube were to fail, would you consider a second tube or what else would you do? Uh, depends upon the time gap. If the tube is, uh, uh, what is meant by failure, it is based on the... After the period, I am saying. So immediate ocular hepatitis phase should be taken care. Yes. And uh, you can even consider opening up and excising the capsule, capsule and applying the mitomycin and closing it. In spite of these measures, if it is not, the glaucoma is re refractory. Yes, you can consider a second. second. Thank you very can much. Can I, can I say something? Yes. Uh, if it's a, if it's a, a, a hemat glaucoma valve, you know, as a valve implant, and if it fails, you know, then uh, if we are to go for a second one, then I would recommend that we don't go again for an hemat, that we go for an RDO. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Hush. Uh, on to you, Dr. Satyan. He, he's going to be talking on simplifying the management of refractive glaucomas. I'm looking forward to learning a lot from you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the disease as well as the topic is a little uh, a challenge. Just to define the refractive glaucoma, it is the uncontrolled intraocular pressure and showing the evidence of optic nerve head damage and the visual field deterioration in spite of maximum medical uh, management and also the surgery or sometimes uh, both the combinations. In spite of that, still the disease is uh, kind of progressing. There are uh, various uh, risk factors which we all know and just to enumerate that few here, this is the neovascular glaucoma is one of the commonest things which we come across, UAT glaucomas, traumatic glaucomas and you can see all the numbers, the list here. So how do we really proceed? This is just my own way of uh, presentation, I mean, uh, way of management, but there are many things can be done. Uh, so I just categorized into three groups. One is those with a good visual potential and those with the poor vision, but then they don't have any pain and those with the pain. So these are the three categories. I've, And once you have that, uh, then you have to have the, what is that next level that you have to go for is the proper examination and what is the investigation that you need to understand. When you're looking at in the slit lamp, of course, your conjunctiva, the existing bleb or the neighboring structure, how it is, how good is your cornea, the uh, angle structures, how it is, and also the neovascularization of the iris and other things needs to be considered because the disease is multifactorial. It is not a single disease. And looking at the investigations, the first two, the fundus photography and the visual fields is not going to show the progression in, in the immediate phase but the OCT can be seen in the immediate phase like uh, the GCL, you can pick it up the changes within the first two weeks itself. They, uh, when you want to look at the NFL, it takes about approximately six to eight weeks. And of course, your EBM also helps in diagnosing what exactly is going on in these patients. So taking these three categories into consideration, we have to have the uh, medic medication or the uh, options for management also. So these are the three categories that we have. Looking at the medications, it is not only the anti glaucoma medications, we have to have the anti metabolites like 5FU injections or the, the MMC injection, the lower dosage. And of course, the cycloimmune, the immunosuppressives, when you have a scar, excessive scar tissue formation or when you want to give the anti VEGF injections, especially in the neovascular glaucoma patients, and to an extent, the amniotic membranes. Or sometimes we have to go for all these uh, uh, combined procedures. Then looking at the management options of the uh, lasers, uh, you have the transcleral uh, uh, diode procedures, especially the uh, micropulse. Of course, the Dr. Sirisa has explained in detail, but we have a different experience. And of course, we have the endocyclophotocoagulation in where the patient has a very complicated uh, disease. And you have the management options uh, when you're looking at the shunt devices, only these are the two available ones, RD tube in India, and of course, the Armand glaucoma valve. Those with the uh, aphakic glaucomas, I would uh, not go with the RD tube. Uh, I would go with the only the Armand glaucoma valve, so that can, that can be discussed later. So those with a good visual potential, you have all the three options to go with medications, laser and the uh, surgical options. But those with the, uh, no pain, but the visual potential is quite poor, you have the option of just reduce the intraocular pressure with the medications and also the lasers. I won't go too much into the uh, surgical option because we know the complications with the surgeries also has an equal problems and uh, looking at the painful thing we have to go for the both medication as well as the cyclo procedures 
but sometimes we may end up with the evisceration or enucleations, but many times we go with the evisceration in at least in some of the eyes. So the care process is going to be controlling the intraocular pressure and addressing the pain in these patients. And of course, taking care of the corneal problems for a, a lifelong period is going to be a challenging task. And looking at the antimetabolite cycloplegics are also equally important. The palliative surgery, uh, how often we go for is a debatable one. And most of the time it is going to be we have to aid in quality of life for these patients and also the rehabilitation and the counseling where the patient goes through a, a phase of a depression. So it's a challenge, but it is not that we cannot win this challenge. Thank you. Uh, it's a very uh, short because it is a too wider a range. Yes. No, no, that was uh, wonderful what you did and you know, you gave us insight. We have to go back and learn from you again. So I'm going to take this question uh, with you, Dr. Vijaya. Could we do a cyclodestructive surgery with a fairly good vision in an extreme scenario? Oh, I mean, I, I don't like to, if you ask me, because uh, we do have options like uh, you know, AGVs and other Adi. If there is a good visual potential, you I don't tend to do, but my experience with the micropulse is very limited, so I cannot comment about that. Dr. Satyan? Uh, I'm not talking about the uh, cyclodiode as a direct procedure. I'm talking about the cyclo G6 in this yeah. because yes, uh, yes. we almost have about uh, 400 patients which we have done as of now. Uh, uh, initially, we had problems, especially when you are doing it at position 3 and 9. But when you don't do that and if you can use the gel, I don't see any problems now. The, especially with the new probes, we don't see any problems now. But it is a challenge how you learn the procedure also is a, a, a task. And also when Sirisa was talking about, I just wanted to say each patient, especially those with the refractory glaucomas, each group of refractory glaucoma gives a different results in a cyclogesics procedure. So that needs to be taken care. Where you have uh, best results is post trabeculectomy eyes where you feel it is going in for a failure. Those are the patients where they come up with the very, very extremely good results we have seen with the post trap failure cases. Thank you. So I'm very sorry, Dr. Shushmita. Incidentally, you became the last speaker and uh, thank you. I know you'd be a great sport and you'll take it along and you have to talk on preferred practical guidelines for childhood glaucoma. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Chitra, for having me in this wonderful session. So childhood glaucoma is a lot like glaucoma. It's uh, similar on the surface, but believe me, there are countless hues beneath. So if I could just list the challenges, they're difficult to examine because you don't know what they have. All of them look very similar. It's a surgical disease and surgery is difficult in these tiny eyes. Post-op follow-up is not easy, but required and we need repeated GA. And the goal is not target intraocular pressure, but the goal for us actually is target vision. And it's not an eye we are treating, it's a whole family. There's genetics, there are other siblings, and there's a the life of the child itself. So if treated in time, uh, this is probably one of the earliest that we have a couple of hours old only, and she grows up to be a normal child going to school as any other. So why is it important knowing what they have? Because most present with the cloudy cornea. For instance, an acute high drop. So this needs surgery early, and a combined trap with trap would be the best. A neonatal onset CEU, if you recognize this, you have to prognosticate that the, to the parents that this is a bad intractable glaucoma requiring multiple surgeries, visual outcomes are poor, and usually they're homozygous for a recessive disease, so each parent is a carrier. Congenital primary aphakia, do not touch the first one that we had, which led us on this journey. And we realize that this is not a simple anterior segment dysgenesis. You touch these eyes, you do incisional surgery, 100% thysis. So recognize this condition. Congenital rubella syndrome, if you don't recognize glaucoma in a small eye. So if there's no bufthalmos and yet there is optic disc cupping, put in a UBM. If you see the cataract, 9 out of 10 times it's rubella. Why that's important is it's not just the eye. There's hearing, there's heart. I've had a child with developmental um, uh, delay until I recognized what it was and when the Eureka moment came, that poor kid just couldn't hear. So all they require is a bearer and a hearing aid and they're as good developmentally as anybody else. So don't write them off 
and they are a problem for newborn glaucoma, which we don't know. UBM has been a, a game changer. It characterizes the glaucoma. Peter's anomaly comes up very well with the Desmet's defect. We've recognized corneal clefts. We didn't know what these looked like. They're actually clefts in the corneal stroma itself. Sometimes it was so puzzling because the pachymetry showed very thin corneas until we recognized that it's because you were doing, you were measuring only part of it. And if you recognize that, you do the surgery, you have a decent uh, periphery, you can do an optical iridectomy. Achoria due to Exenfeld Riegers, a lot of these achorias we would just write off until we recognize that they're actually detached Schwabe's line which carry the iris along with it and a simple pupilloplasty can actually um, change it. We've also seen Desmet's defects which are so large that the lens is actually in the cornea. These are eyes which you don't need to really chase because uniformly they do bad. I've talked about congenital primary aphakia, again UBM, dysgenetic cornea, dysgenetic trabecular meshwork, and not developed ciliary body. So it's a very, very complex disease. Surgery is difficult, but important to decide what to do. If it's PCG or any other non-acquired developmental glaucoma, Some. angle surgery would be our preference. If you can even see the iris insertion through a hazy cornea, they do very well. Acquired glaucomas in children usually require a trabeculectomy with MMC. The angle surgeries don't work so well. Post-op follow-up requires repeated GA, but you need to recognize that there is an association between repeated general anesthesia and cognitive decline, which is what went, uh, we went ahead and considered sedation. Intranasal dexmetidomidine has worked very well for us. It precludes anesthesia in a lot of children, and we just need to put the child to sleep, and that's, that's all that we do. So the things to look for, yes, we are dealing with glaucoma, so it's IOP, but it's also cornea and it's also the axial length. So these are equally important because in an elastic eye, you could have an enlarging eye under the influence of raised pressure and you will not be measuring that pressure as high. So if you are not looking at the axial length, so rebound tonometry is uh, the eye care is commonly used. The baby, by the time they're in the mother's lap, there's nothing that we need to do. Maybe you have somebody just ring a bell behind and they are fine. But remember, GAT in awake children is still the most accurate method of IOP measurement. Don't run away with just doing eye care and nothing else. Rebound tonometry often overestimates IOP, especially if it's more than 20, 21 millimeters. And overestimation also increases with increasing CCT. So we've talked about this, the IOP being normal with the axial length. So this preterm baby with ROP underwent an LIO and then required a left uh, uh, lens sparing vitrectomy. Post LSV, she had bufthalmos. Now they had been checking pressures, but they're not been checking axial length. So the pressures were consistently normal until they noticed this bufthalmos in center to me. The pressure was still normal, but there was no question that this eye had glaucoma. This is something which, this is Sam Paulus's graph of normal intraocular pressure. We use this growth chart routinely. It's part of our uh, pediatric glaucoma file. And I would say it's, it's helped us so much because we chart the growth according to this growth curve. And you can see for this baby, it went up till there until we did the CTT and then it actually stabilized. So the pressure was out of the equation for this child with glaucoma. You can see the cornea having cleared and the axial length having stabilized. So that's just one caveat. When would we start thinking of doing an EUA? We usually have cut down on it with the eye care and axial length. I'll take just 10 seconds more. And uh, so, sorry. So anyway, so if the axial length is continuously rising, if the IOP is high, but if you're doing angle surgery, suture removal. During the COVID time, we've lost one eye to suture infiltrate panophthalmitis and it had to be eviscerated. So suture removal is our huge, huge reason for doing an EUA after goniotomy or a, a angle surgery. Just to touch upon a novel idea of propranolol, sometimes you think out of the box, it's helped us in these kind of horrible exudative sturge weavers. We haven't seen it after that. So we are happy that, we, that uh, it happened. The lessons beyond glaucoma is that babies have a life. They live it fully despite huge odds. The babies are parts of families. These are three generations of Axenfeld Rieger and a whole family of Anairide except the dad who doesn't have it. So the real lessons are of patience, hope, and gratitude. I'm just sharing this two, uh, 
this is a child with congenital primary aphakia. All they need is aphakia glasses and a limited DLCP. Oh, and the fellow is as naughty as anybody else, but we are happy that we have now recognized them and he can do what we want. I've passed the madness along to my senior residents and this is my team. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was a most uh, motivating talk. And one question because we are yet to start. Uh, what would be your target uh, IOP in childhood? Maybe 15 or less you would say is okay? Well, let uh, the child be for newborn children. The normal intraocular pressure is low teens. It's about yeah. 12. Oh. So 15 would be high and definitely yeah. not the less than 21. But like I said, the intraocular pressure that you measure might be 12. But if the axial length is increasing or horizontal corneal diameter is increasing, then that pressure is not being reflected. It's like a balloon. So you push it. It will never be hard. Any role of GAT in children? Oh, GAT. G uh, yeah. Goldman? Goldman uh, application? Yes. Yeah, Perkins is the standard. No, no, no. GAT procedure. Yes, of course. Yeah. Anytime. Any. If I if I have a child now, it's almost always GAT if I have okay. to do an angle procedure because it helps me not uh, not requiring to come back. Okay. Thank you so much. I think I should stand up with folded hands to thank you <laughs> because only my superb glaucomatologist of this country could have allowed me to have the session complete with decent discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, photograph if it's possible, but we'll have to start the next session. All of you have come for a cataract. I want all my expert panel to come here and the speakers too, whoever is there. Dr. Vijaya.